All right. Let's get rocking and rolling here. How are you guys? <laughs> How are you folks in the uh, dev class? Are you surviving? Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> and a couple of you were taking three, right? All three? Yes. Yeah. Hey, you're surviving. It's really? <laughs> awesome. All right. All right, I'm going to zip through attendance real quick. So if you guys could just be audible for me, that'd be sweet. Dara? Melissa? Rock? Yep. Lucas? Yeah, I was going to say, I kind of saw him. Andrew? Yep. Aurora? Yeah. Lisa? Here. Nico? Here. Austin? Here. Dylan? Here. And Tim, I know, is here I saw. And then Brendan, I saw. Okay. All right. Um, so, just as a, a little bit of housekeeping real quick, if you guys could please, please, please um, take a couple minutes at some point next day or two to shoot back Anthony some evaluations on class. It just helps us. <laughs> no. <laughs> it helps me gauge. Uh, it's the first time I've done an accelerated class like this, and so every little bits and pieces of feedback I can get just helps for uh, future iterations. Alright, um, right, so are you guys ready to jump into Max today? Oh my gosh, this is my most favorite part. <laughs> it's it's nothing but fun from here on out. Um, so remind me again, how many of you have worked in 3ds Max before? Okay. Brendan, you have? Did you have a little bit? Yeah. Did you take comparative? Is that you did? Okay. Okay. So um, for you in particular, and if anybody has previous 3D experience, because I know some of you have taken my Maya class, um, I'm going to expect you to take the baseline stuff that we're doing for homework and stuff and do a step beyond that, right? Because I know you can, basically. Lucky you. <laughs> okay. Um, how many of you had Maya before? Okay, I know you guys have kind of... Okay, okay. Um, I'll talk a little bit about... Obviously, we're going to be focusing on Max. Um, for those of you who've had the Maya, I'll make comments about, hey, this is your equivalent, your Maya equivalent. So... Um, it just gives you a little bit of framework to base some of the stuff that we're doing on um, since you have some familiarity with it on, in another program. My recommendation for those of you who are touching a 3D package for the first time, start with one. Don't jump into two and try to learn the both at the same time. You'll pull your hair out. If you get comfortable in one, it's really easy at that point to switch over. There's a lot of similarities. Um, but there's just enough difference in there that can drive you crazy too. So, um, just some things to think about, just overview from the, since we're, fo our focus really is the CG side, right? And from here on out, that's pretty much what we're going to be doing is the CG stuff. Um, I get questions about <clears throat> which package should I jump into depending upon what it is that I'm doing. Um, Maya and 3ds Max are the two primary ones that you're going to find in the industry. There's obviously there's some other outliers as well. You'll hear um, Cinema 4D pop up, um, Blender. Obviously, I think some of you had some previous Blender experience. Um, where you will tend to see one over the other, Maya tends to be the primary for film and advertising. 3ds Max tends to be the primary for games. If you had to kind of section them out, that said, that's changing. It's changing for a few reasons. VR is a big part of that. Um, as companies start to move into developing for VR, it's frameworked out of game engines. As a result, you're building game assets or essentially building game assets. And so you're going to see kind of a shift there. Can you do a lot of the same stuff in Maya? Absolutely. And there will be companies that will just stick in that. Um, it's kind of six to one half dozen at this point. They are kind of doing this. I still think though, and part of the reason why we're doing 3ds Max in here is there are some tools um, relevant to game dev that are a little bit more comprehensive within the Max package. Additionally, because it's been the sort of primary within the game world for so long, there's a lot more with regard to um, reference material and resources specific to that that I just don't find quite with Maya yet. Will that change? Yes. 
likely will. Um, but the workflow within Max is really set up for a gaming type environment, and so that's why we're using it. Um, now, remind me again how many of you are Macintosh users? Oh, more than I thought. Okay. <laughs> um, so as you've discovered, 3DS Max does not have a Macintosh version yet. Well, I know. Um, it's kind of curious as to why. I'm not, I can't answer that. I don't know why. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but it is what it is. For this class, this particular part one, anything we do in 3DS Max, you can absolutely do in Maya. Um, and what I might do, since there's enough of you, is once we get through the Max part of it, those interested, I have equivalent notes for Maya. Um, and I'm happy to demo that stuff while other, the rest of you are kind of working on your other things. Um, it's entirely up to you. I'll kind of leave that sort of open-ended. But if you'd like those notes so you can do some of this stuff at home on Maya, you're welcome to. Just be aware, and here's my caveat with that, um, as we progress into different parts or to subsequent parts of this class, we're going to be doing things that are pretty Mac specific. So at some point, um, could you, could we do a little R&D and find the Maya equivalent? Most likely, but it's not going to be identical to what I'm demoing in class. So I'm going to kind of leave it up to you in terms of how you want to pursue that. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Uh, as another alternative, and what I have had students do in the past is, depending upon how attached you are to your, well, and I guess I don't know that it would even make that big of a difference, because um, I don't think it changes your Mac side of it, but you could mirror a uh, Windows platform on your Mac systems and run Macs that way. I've done that in classrooms that have been entirely Mac labs. <laughs> Um, but it takes a little bit of setting up, so we could do some research into that if it interests you. Okay. Um, so, as far as the local industry, in terms of who uses what, it's split. It really is split down the middle, and it has been for a long time. Um, there are a couple reasons for that. One of the biggest reasons is that in the past, and I don't know if this is so much the case now, but in the past, you could maintain a max license for about half the cost of a Maya license. And so what you saw is a lot of the smaller to mid-sized studios switching over to a Mac based or a max based environment because it was more cost effective for them to do that. The studio that I worked out of um, was exactly that situation. We were, you know, maybe 10 employees. We're a smaller company. Um, we were predominantly film and advertising type of material. We were a Maya house for a very long time, and then it just became apparent that it was going to be better for us um, to switch. And we ended up switching to Max, and then we became an entirely 3DS Max house. Um, so in Portland, that's kind of what you're going to find. You're going to find a, a pretty decent split. Um, so, um, all right. I will say, usually with the 3D applications, and those of you who've <laughs> had my intro classes before, um, there is a it is a fairly steep learning curve to learn the 3D packages. There's a lot going on, and there's a lot of sub menus. There's a lot of buttons. Um, but what I want you to keep in mind is feeling a little overwhelmed initially is normal, and if you're having a moment. Just step away from it. You'd be surprised how big of a difference that makes when you step away for an hour and come back. Go grab coffee. I don't care. Call somebody. <laughs> um, it does make a difference. And then just stick with it. I'm gonna, I want you to focus in on the very specific things that we're going to talk about. Don't look at all the other crap. I mean, if you want to explore, you're absolutely welcome to. But I can tell you this. I've been working in these programs for 17 years now, and I feel like I know this much. So don't don't be don't feel like you're the only one. Um, it's all slow, steady progress, and you know you're just going to expand upon tools that you're that you'll learn. You have a, a new task that's thrown at you. If you can't get it done with the current tool set, you'll do a little research on tools that might be more appropriate, and then you'll add one more thing to your toolbox of of skills. That's really just how it goes. Okay. Um, so within CG, within the world of CG. There are specializations that you guys 
would really work within. Uh, very rarely, even in the game industry, game, film, advertising, doesn't really matter. Um, very rarely are you going to be doing everything. I'll we'll call that a generalist. Being proficient, really proficient as a generalist is tough to do and it takes a lot of years to do it. Um, so typically when you're going out and you're applying for jobs in the TV world, you're applying for something, a specialization within that world. We're going to be focusing in on a couple specializations in here. Some of them we won't necessarily be focusing in on. A, because of time constraints, or B, because it's not necessarily as applicable to us in the VR side of things. So in terms of specializations, and I'm going to kind of order this as it's ordered in the pipeline. How, you know, from start to finish, if you were going to start a production, where you would begin and kind of what things would be towards the end, okay? The first thing is modeling. So, I think I asked this maybe the one of the classes. How many of you have used play ever? Like, yeah, it's very similar, only you've got an undo button, which is really great, right? I love that. Um, you are just pushing and pulling stuff around to get it to look the way you want it to look. That's what modeling is. And you saw a little bit of it when we jumped into the Unity. Um, we tinkered with our terrain to get it to look the way we wanted it to. Now, were we going and doing it in a traditional CG method, using CG methods? No. Right, we were kind of painting things in and doing some other things. We weren't necessarily thinking about poly counts and convert counts and all that stuff that we have to start thinking about as we move forward modeling. Um, but we're going to start doing that. And it'll make more sense because we're going to actually, at this point, begin dealing with the components of a piece of geometry. Does anybody remember what those components are? Yeah, vertices, edges. edges. Yeah, you're real close. Yeah, the faces. So, the, so just remember pa the paper mache thing we talked about? That's basically what it is, right? So, first thing you start with the modeling, which is what we're going to begin. Next part of this specialization, and you'll get jobs that are specific to modelers. They just want you to do all they want. That's what they want you to do. You come in, we want you to make environments, we want you to make props, we want you to make characters, and it even breaks out into those areas. You'll find modeling jobs specific to just character modeling, and just environmental modeling, and just modeling assets. Right? It can get that specific. And the reason for that is once you start focusing in on an area, there are some intricacies that go into that. You've got your hard surface modeling and organic modeling. So more than organic style would be characters. Things that are very smooth and fluid. Hard surface would be like if I was gonna go and model this monitor. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Next train. Talk a little bit about this. We talked a little bit about this last week and some things that we'll have to consider uh, when we're going into the VR world. Um, it's very similar to a game pipeline with regard to the texturing, um, but there are some slight considerations that we're going to have to make, particularly with the normal mapping. So you guys remember what I said with regard to the normal maps in VR? Any thoughts? You guys remember from last week? Okay, let's start. Let's actually take a step back. What's a normal map? Okay, yeah, so it's giving us depth information, right? It's it's taking information from a model that we've created and it's basically baking down, you guys remember baking? Yeah, baking down information so that we can get high levels of detail on a model that is a lower poly model. Okay. So does it change the silhouette? And it, we are using a texture map to bring that information in. Now, in VR, in, in, a game, in a game world, that would be sufficient to get our depth information. If we're looking at stuff on our monitor, most of what you're going to do is send your around normal maps. Now, in VR, we can't rely just on the normal maps. And the reason for that is we got we, we have the, the normal maps don't deal with the parallax issue that we get within the VR environment. So it has to do with how things, how quickly things look like they're moving relative to how close they are to us, and it throws off the depth perception of those maps. And 
so what happens, for those that thought doesn't make sense, what happens is those maps are flat. It looks like a 2D image on a surface. So as an alternative, we'll still have our normal maps, but we also have to introduce what are called parallax maps with height maps. That'll go in and create the additional depth for us that we need in a VR environment. So it's kind of like, the best way I can describe it is, and you'll hear this term in film more than anything else, is if I've got an object, let's say right in front of me, this pen, let's say it's moving at the same speed as something back by that building, because of the distance, the thing back by that building is going to feel like it's moving slower than this. And what happens as we're interacting in our environment it does some weird stuff with the depth perception that the normal maps create on a piece of geometry, and it does not feel as convincing as it does when we're just looking at it on a monitor. As a result, if we start introducing the height maps, that's going to make those things actually feel like the protruding from the surface. So if you guys take a look at, you probably haven't had an opportunity because I know you've been a real long time. Uh, other class stuff. Um, but the VR, intro to VR notes that I put together for you guys last week, there's a section in there dealing specifically with that. Take a look at it as a reference. You just kind of refer back to it. Are we going to deal with that a lot right now? No. We probably won't even get to this part really legitimately until at least part two of the class. We just don't have the bandwidth to do it because it's a panel work. And those of you who have my texturing and stuff know this. <laughs> um, but this whole area, texturing, lighting, is a CG focus. The people will go out and they will do specific jobs related to that. Okay? All right. Okay. So you can use height maps in regular, like, for no, you film can. texturing? You can. You can. It's just not as pivotal. And I got it. For the stuff that we did, it, what it boils down to is what your deadlines are. Because they can be a little heavier, which is sort of an oxymoron if you think about us using it for a VR environment. Um, so you, it's a trade-off in terms of time. Um, you don't really need it. You can use it, but I don't think you really need it for some of the other stuff. As, to the same degree that you need it for the VR. Um, now, could you get away without it? Yeah. I said, and it kind of goes back actually a little bit more to our conversation of last week. Every situation, every project you work on has different pros and cons associated with it. And it all boils down to speed, quality, and what your deadline is. What can you get away with in the time that you have allotted? What I love to go in every project and like tap every, you know, Every option I have to make this thing look just amazing, like so, like mind blowing. Me. Yes, I would. Is that realistic? No, no, it's not. <laughs> and some of it also you're restricted down by your computing power. What do you have accessible to you with regard to your hardware? You might not really be able to tap into some of that stuff based off of what you're working on. Some of it, if you have access to a render form, knock yourself out. <laughs> um, we actually, I think, maybe I can put this up, but we do have a setup here that we can tap into that's pretty nice um, in terms of render farm and stuff. Um, but, you know, if you're going to max the system out, as some of you know, especially you guys in particular who just have my intro to Maya class, renders take time. Now, are we going to necessarily worry about that for a year? No, because we're, doing, we're going into a real time environment. So we have a whole other can of worms we have to worry about. Um, but what the moral of the story is, or what I want you to get from this, is don't don't overthink it. Focus on the task at hand and what parameters you have within that particular task, rather than being overwhelmed by what could be. You know what I mean? Does that make, kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. So those who have not had me for class, does anybody know what this is? We mentioned it, I think, already once. It's yes, really creating the structure for characters or for animation. Yeah, yeah. So think real life scenario. Let's say I've got a character. 
The model part is the skin. In order for the skin to move in real life, what do I need under it? I mean, bones, right? I'd be a mushy pile on the floor. Yep, joints. I need all that stuff. Well, the same thing applies for CD. Okay. So why does that happen after modeling? You need skin because the skin gives you your like your reference point, right? But doesn't your skeleton give you your reference point? Mm, no. <laughs> not in this case. It's not, it's not like real I see where you're going. I see where you're going with this, but no, not in this case. And it'll make more sense when you do it. Okay. Yeah. It helps to know it's not, you're not building an actual skeleton. Like, it's components that look like they, they form a like, metaphorical skeleton. Yeah. You have to move it, but it's not like a skeleton you can place on there. So, like, connected points of activity. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so like, like, all right. Yeah. You're gonna love my drawing. This is why I'm not a demonstrator. <laughs> right. So let's say I got my character, right? Got arms. <laughs> Don't be jealous. <laughs> they let me teach things. <laughs> Alright, so I got my I got my character here. The skeleton is not gonna be as finite as like what we see in our right. It's going to be representation. So triangles, a little joints, more triangles. Maybe we've got a series of triangles here for fingers. Right? So it's not it's not something we would reference our model around necessarily. It really is kind of a Unless we were trying to create the physics first. No, not no. even that. Okay, well, not. <laughs> yeah, you'd be surprised. And it, it, if it doesn't make 100% sense right now, that's okay. It it will when you do it. It's going to make a, a light bulb going to come on. So like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Because you're basically just putting stuff where you want it to be. Yeah, you want to see. So if you've modeled an elbow here, you're going to know that you need a joint right there. Right? But you need to know where the elbow is before you can add the joint. Uh, it kind of doesn't go the other way around because we're just kind of using primitive shapes really to create the skeleton. Um, now you can have prefab rigs made that you just toss in any model and then you have to kind of account, you know, just appropriately. Um, that's a, an advanced rigging thing that we won't get to. Uh, but at the very least, I want to just make sure you guys understand what it is. Um, because most things that, particularly characters, if we have a character animating in any of our scenes, they're going to likely have a rig associated with them, because that rig is what allows our animators to actually animate. Without this, the mesh just is sitting there looking pretty. Does that make sense? Okay. So the rigging is our bone structure. And I can pull up, I'll find a, a rigged character. I can pull it up and show you what it looks like, and maybe that'll make, make a little more sense. Uh, riggers, I will tell you, if that's something interesting, it tends to be a topic that my more technically minded people really enjoy. Um, particularly those who program, because it, when you get to more advanced rigging techniques, it does tend to be a little bit more on the programming side. Uh, and it's in high demand. So if this interests you, whew, fine work. All right. Animating. Once you have a rig in place, we can start adding controllers to that. And then our animators can go in and start animating. Uh, I have found that these two areas, very people tend to draw very specific, specifically to uh, specific types of people are drawn to them. Animation can be a number of different things. You can animate anything in these programs. You can animate lights. You can animate cameras. You can animate inanimate objects, boxes, whatever. Uh, you also have character animation, which is kind of its own specialty. 
Um, I will tell you, I am not by trade a character animator. Of my skill set, that's way down at the bottom of the pole. Um, but I have friends, and part of it is because I just sort of love it, but I have friends that love it. That's like all they want to do. The rest of it, they could cross. But give them a character to animate all day long. That would be my nice for me, but hey, you know, it's each their own. Right. Um, you'll also find that these two things, usually, not always, but oftentimes animators will know how to rig and vice versa, and it's because there's such a relationship there. Um, if, you, if you can dictate or know how you want to animate a character, setting the rig up appropriately goes a long, long way. Or at least being able to talk to your riggers and being able to explain what the intention is and having that communication channel open um, and being able to kind of speak the language back and forth also makes a big difference in a pipeline. So you'll see these two sometimes mesh together. You also see these two often mesh together. Um, rarely will you see a modeler who can't do some form of texturing. Um, sometimes it happens, but usually when you're in a modeling job, they're going to expect you to also be able to texture. All right. So we got animating, and then from there on out, we've got things that like uh, effects. Effects work. So things like, you know, if you're looking in the, well, I guess either side of the industry, you're looking at explosions, fire, wind, particles. I mean, just those dust particles that we did last week, that was an example of some effects work. Very simple effects work, but we did it, right? Um, hair, fur, those types of things are very specific specializations that you'll find jobs for, and they're also in high demand because they can be very, very tedious. Very gratifying when you see the end result, but tedious to get there. Okay. Um, we won't deal so much in this world because it is computationally heavy. Whether you're in the film side or the game side, this tends to suck down on your system pretty good depending upon what it is that you're doing. Um, but, interesting area to explore on your own if you're interested. Um, and then, I mean, we can kind of go off from here into a slew of different things. So, we've got the dev stuff, right, the programming that some of you guys are doing. We've got audio production, right. Um, we've got, if we're looking at the game world, we're looking somewhere in this stack here, we're looking at level design. So when you guys did your, uh, that's on the screen. I didn't even know what I was trying to spell there. <laughs> it didn't come out that way. <laughs> no, so it's, um, it's like my fourth grade handwriting as we get low. So last week when we did the uh, terrain that we were working with, you guys did some level design. You guys did some set dressing where you went in there and you really played with how you wanted that level to lay out and look for the player. Uh, so yeah, I'm sure not getting anything up there right now. Oh, ah, we got it. All right, cool. Uh, and then, you know, like I said, we could kind of go off from there on some other completely different directions. Where we're going to really focus in on with regard to this series of classes is right here. That's going to be our main focus. Depending upon what potential capstone needs might be, we might, and I emphasize might, we have to do a little of that. But we're mostly going to be here. Okay? Any questions so far? Is modeling your specialty? Like, what is your? Uh, lighting, texturing. It's modeling, too. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have a specialty anymore. It's, um, you know, my job, uh, when I was at the studio, I was in a position where I had to do it all. And so I had to become very proficient in all of these very, very quickly. The area that I didn't have to be proficient in was character animating, which is probably why I was forced to do that, and that's probably why I would um, But everything else, I mean, it, it, do I have an area that I like the most? Yeah. This is where my love is. 
Um, this is fun too. Get some time to get on my nerves. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about different modeling types. So you guys are going to hear terminology when you're in the CG world dealing with poly modeling, NURBS modeling, subdivisions, although that's kind of phasing out these days. Uh, we're focusing in on poly modeling. That is the game world is polys. The other thing that we need to keep in mind with regard to the modeling style I'll just bring it up now. We'll talk about it again as we kind of move forward or just emphasize it a little bit. You guys all good here? Okay. I'm going to just put it up on here for now. And then we'll come back to it. and how it relates to what the heck we're doing. Okay, so let's jump into uh, 3ds Max. So do you guys have it open? If you don't, why don't you go ahead and open it up? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna set Max so that it has a workflow similar, or I shouldn't say workflow. Um, it has some standard keyboard shortcuts that are identical to Maya which also happen to be identical to Unity. So it's going to make the transition a lot easier um, rather than sticking in the, the Max native. It's a really easy thing to switch. Um, so once you guys have, once I kind of see folks having this open. And you guys will have two smaller assignments that actually should be a lot of fun, and most of which you might actually get done before you even leave class because I'm going to have you walk through them with me as I'm doing it. Um, and then from there, it's going to be just more about you exploring and having fun <laughs> and just seeing what you can come up with. Um, okay. So the very first thing that we're going to do, we're going to set up our project structure. Unlike Unity, once you jump into 3ds Max or Maya, you need to set your project structure in order to save your scene files and in order to reference and content. It's really important that we keep this organized and that we create one. Will it cause us a ton of problems just when we're just modeling? No, but once we start texturing and adding textures to a scene and we're having to reference that information in, it makes a major, major difference. Um, the other thing is that it's a standard pipeline thing. So as you are creating content, whether you're in a game world, a film world, doesn't really matter, your project structure is gonna be something that you are not the only one working in. Your coworkers are going to be working in it with you. Um, maintaining specific naming conventions, maintaining where things are located makes a very big difference in how you work with your colleagues. And the more organized you are, the happier coworkers you're going to have. <laughs> um, and you'll make more friends that way. You don't want to piss people off keeping your stuff unorganized. So to do this, um, the easiest way or the way that I usually do it is right up here in the upper left hand corner. And I'll have you guys do this with me. You guys see the 3ds Max icon? If I click on the arrow next to it and scroll down all the way almost to the bottom where it says manage, it's going to give me a sub menu to my right called set project folder. So I'm going to click on that. And in doing that, it's going to give me a dialog box. Now, the thing to keep in mind, for the first time, since we don't already have a project structure created, we need to create one. So I'm going to navigate to wherever it is I want to save it for the moment. For right now, if you guys remember me telling you, do this stuff on your desktops. Don't do it on your thumb drives or your hard drives because you have the possibility to corrupt files if you do. Right? So I'm going to put mine right on my desktop and I'm going to say make new folder. And once I make a new folder, it's going to ask me to rename it. And I can name it something specific to the project that we're going to do. So the first project that we are going to do is, um, and have you guys do like a little primitive vehicle. Like I said, for those of you who have had my CG stuff, I want you to do more. Okay. All right. 
So what I'm going to do is, I, for you guys, I'm going to use the same naming convention that we've kind of been using for the other projects. So I'm going to type in my last name, then my first name, underscore vehicle. I'm going to hit enter. Once that's done, I'm going to hit OK. Now, once I've done that, you're going to notice that on your desktop or wherever it is you saved this project structure, I now have a folder system that Max has created for me. This is the folder system that we need to maintain in order for Max to know where things are. Now, are we going to go in and change the naming conventions of these folders? No. We don't need to. Could we add subfolders? Yes, absolutely. And we will do that. But Max is going to look to these very specifically to find certain things. Okay. Um, the most obvious and the one that you guys have already encountered is which folder? Scenes. Scenes. Yeah. So that's a really nice transition between what we've done already in Unity. We're going to save all of our scene files in our scenes folder. Yeah, some things are needed to kind of get initialized the first time. Ah, uh, okay. So, where, what part are you at? Oh, okay. Go to the icon in the upper left-hand corner and click on it. And then you're going to scroll down to where it says Manage. And you're going to choose Set Project Folder. Yeah. Once it starts, it starts faster the next couple times. Cool. Okay. And then just navigate to wherever it is you want to create it. Hit Make New Folder, Name It, and hit OK. Now, the one thing you're going to notice now, if let's go ahead and save our first scene file. We don't have anything in here yet, but we're going to save it anyway. Is if I click on the upper left-hand corner where my max icon is, I can choose Save Scene As. And the first thing you're going to notice is because I have my project structure set, it's dropping me right into my scenes folder already. That's what I want. That tells me that Max is referencing this folder configuration in order to organize my files. So I can give my scene my first name. And when I'm working in CG files, I save in increments always. I never save over the same file over and over again, and nor should you. Um, the reason for that is if you, oops, and you can't figure out how to get back, um, you have a file to revert back to. Or let's say something gets corrupted, which happens. Um, you want to only have lost a half an hour's worth of work versus, say, two weeks. Right? So I'm going to say 01 Insire and Vehicle. Something like that. Right? Hit save. It's going to save into my scenes folder. Okay? And now I'm off and running. Now, because I have my project structure already created, the next time I go into this project, I don't have to recreate a project structure. I just simply need to point Max to it. The nice thing is, it's in the exact same location that we do this. So, if I were to have just opened Max for the first time, as in I went home, I came back, whatever, and I'm going to start working in the scene file again, before... I do anything, and you, you really want to follow these steps. Don't just double click on your Mac file when you go home or when you come back, um, because it's not setting a project structure to do that. So what you want to do when you're opening this project structure on the next round, open Max first. Set your project structure. I'm going to show you how to do that. And then go to open scene. Okay? Don't double click on your Max file to open it, is what I'm telling you. Now, if you did that, could you still point it? Yes, but it just is an extra step you don't need to do. So, let's say, yeah. Sorry, what is the set structure piece? So open Max. I'm showing you, I'm going to show you right now. Yeah. Yeah, so to set the stru project structure, I'm going to go back to the. Uh, icon. I'm going to go to manage, set project folder. Now this time, rather than clicking on make a new one, because I don't need to, I already have it, I'm just going to double click on it and hit OK. I've now set it. And so now when I go to file open, it's going to open my scene folder for me and now I can open my max file. Make sense? Yeah. Um, so I'll have you guys do that before we leave class, just to make sure. 
Um, it's just going to help you get into good habits now. Will it be catastrophic if you don't do it right the first few times? No, not at all. Um, but I want to help you guys get into some good habits. Okay. Okay. Um, a couple other folders. If we look at this project structure, just of note, really, this auto back folder is a nice little feature in Max. Uh, Max has an auto save feature, particularly when it crashes, um, <laughs> which let me tell you has saved my bacon more times than <laughs> I'd care to admit. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a story on that here in a second, but um, if you have an issue where your Max file crashes on you and you have to close Max out, say you have a fatal error, whatever, it just it happens. Um, check your auto back folder and see if there is a save in there. More often than not, there will be. And you should be able to recover stuff pretty quickly. And I'll show you where to save your auto backs because, or, or how to set your auto back saving. Because when you get to a scene file that's a heavy, after a while, having it save every five minutes on you is a real pain in the butt. It slows your workflow way down. So we can adjust how many times it saves and how many iterations it saves and it makes life a little easier. Um, but yeah. Uh, when I was working, <laughs> when I was working at the studio, we uh, we were doing some beta testing on a new piece of hardware for an unnamed company, um, and I got to use this computer that wasn't supposed to be out on the market for several several years. And this thing was fast; it was really fast. It was like a jet engine under my desk. You turned it on, and you could feel the <laughs> fan blowing on the knees of my coworker <laughs> next to me. Um, but man, it just smoked. And after a while, I don't know what happened with it, but after a while, it got a little screwy where my max files were crashing maybe every 20 minutes all day, every day for three months. I, I was almost bald from ripping my hair out, but the auto backs helped save because trying to work around that was like every five minutes save. So, and if you're dealing with really heavy files, I mean, you can imagine it takes some time to save those heavy files. So it was, uh, it started off as a beautiful marriage and then just turned, <laughs> went south <laughs> from there. Man, wish I could have that speed back though. I have yet to find a computer that had that kind of speed. I mean, it was just like lightning fast, crazy. All right, so autobacks, good folder now. Um, the other folders, we've got our scene assets. Eventually, this is where we're going to be putting our texture maps. We've got an images folder for that. Um, I may also, in your notes, I, I have you putting your renders in here the way in a render subfolder. You can absolutely do that. I will look there. Or uh, what I've done in the past, too, is put a folder in render output. So that makes more sense to me for rendering something to put it in a renders output folder. doesn't really matter for rendering stuff out. So we'll get to that at some point. Um, but just some things to keep in mind. Okay. Um, okay. Any questions so far with project structure? No? Makes sense? Okay, good. Um, I do have an alternative way of setting the project structure in Max here. I'm not going to go through it. I'll let you guys toy with that. They both do the same darn thing. I think the way I just showed you is the most intuitive and probably the most user-friendly, which is why I'm going to have you guys do it that way. Okay. Um, all right. Next thing we want to do is let's set this to the um, a Maya, kind of a Maya mirrored hotkey setup. So to do that, what I want you to do is up here at the top in the main menu where it says customize. Everybody find that so far? Under preferences, down at the very bottom, go ahead and click on that. And it's going to pull up our preferences dialog box. Um, this preferences dialog box is super handy for a lot of things. First thing I'm going to show you, under the general tab, see where it says scene undo? This controls the number of times you can hit control Z and back out of an oops. <laughs> 20 is not a lot. It's not a lot. For some of you, you're going to need a lot to start with. So, to increase this, give it a good number. Maybe we got 500, I don't care. Um, 
<laughs> just throw a higher number in there than 20. Right? That way, if you have to undo, you can undo a bunch. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, Brent, <laughs> Brent, can you do it 500 times? Oh, I've done it more than 500 Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll have moments, especially when it's like late at night and you screw up something and you're like, my brain is not functioning anymore. <laughs> We're just sitting there doing this. Yeah, it happens. Um, okay. Next thing I want you to guys, I want you guys to look at is the files tab. Down here on the left-hand side towards the bottom, see where it says auto backup? This deals with our auto back folder that we were just talking about. Right now, um, I'll leave it up to you in terms of how many auto back files you would want to save. Um, I usually knock this down to like one or two. And then number and intervals, I don't need this saving on me every five minutes. I would say if you start somewhere around 30 minutes, you're in a pretty good place or an hour, right? It kind of depends on how <laughs> how much do you trust your system, how much do you trust your software, and how much do you trust yourself, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> every 30 seconds, please. Uh, yeah, so that's where you make that adjustment. So adjust accordingly based off what you feel comfortable with. All right, next thing I want you to do is click on the interaction mode tab. Now by default, this is likely for you guys, especially if you've just opened Macs for the first time, it's likely set to 3DS Max. I want you to change this to Maya. The reason for this is it's gonna be a much smoother transition from Unity in, in here. And for those of you who have Maya experience, this will make the transition also smoother. <laughs> Go ahead and hit okay. And if you're moving in and out of these two pieces of software, like I move in and out of these pretty interchangeably. Um, and it's just nice to have the same hotkeys. It makes my life easier. You'll occasionally I'll, I'll find people that are really diehard where it's like, if you're in max, use the max, you know, configuration. I don't understand really why, but works the same. That's all about timeline and workflow and comfort and making deadlines. Who cares? <laughs> but teach them. So just be aware. You'll find the, you'll find the, the diehards, right? Okay, so if we take a general overlook of our interface here, um, we'll just kind of work our way around. Up here at the top, we've got our main menu. Pretty straightforward. It's going to give us information, um, really anything that we can access within our Max interface, we can find somewhere in the main menu. This is never really going to change. It stays put. It's, it is what it is. Right? Very similar to what you find in most applications. Right below it, we've got our toolbar where we've got some sort of pipeline, very commonly used pipeline tools, things like snapping. Um, we can go in and we can make some adjustments um, on how our pivot point is being read. This is where we'd go in and maybe click a button to render something to check it to see what it looks like. Um, so we've got some things that we're going to use fairly often up on this toolbar that we'll talk about as we encounter them. Sound good? Okay. Um, right below the toolbar, we have what's called the ribbon. Now, for those of you who have worked in Maya, this is very much like our, our uh, tab system. And it's as equally customizable as the tab system in Maya. Um, we'll talk about that next week on how to do that. But essentially what this is are commonly used tools depending upon what editing mode you're in. So if I'm modeling, it's going to give me common tools for modeling a piece of geometry. Um, so we can go in there and anywhere I see a tab, I can click on the tab and I can see the options, sort of the sub options available for that particular tab. Okay. Now, I don't have anything really going on in my scene right now, so there's not a whole lot up here. But as soon as I start adding geometry to my scene, we're going to see this populate. Most of what we're going to stick within is our modeling tab. 99% of the time for what we're going to do in this class specifically, we're going to be working within the modeling tab. Okay. All right. Right below our ribbon, we've got what's called the scene explorer. For my Maya users, this is much like our outliner. 
we have some pros and we've got some cons in terms of how one functions over the other, but there's some features with the Scene Explorer that actually I like a little bit better than the Outliner. Um, and we'll talk about what some of that stuff is. Okay. Down towards the bottom, we can adjust our viewport layout. So if, for example, on the fly, right now we're working in a four panel view. Um, if I wanted to adjust that, if I click on the arrow down here in the lower left hand corner, it's gonna give me some options in terms of how my panels are laid out. It's a workflow thing. It is entirely up to you in terms of what you prefer. I usually just stick in a four panel unless I'm doing some like camera work and I'm trying to really see my edits as I'm working within a camera or something, but generally I'm just moving in and out of these viewports. Okay. Um, all right, to the right of this, we've got our time slider. All of this really deals with our animation features. It's not something we're gonna talk about right away. Um, we may dabble a little bit in it as we progress through our class series, but um, this is where we would do the bulk of our animating. Okay. So our time side are here, and then we've got player controls right over here to the right hand side, very much like a DVD player. All right, play, stop, rewind, that sort of thing. What we do want to pay attention to, or what's going to be relevant more for us as we're modeling, is right down here. Um, which is our transform tools. This is kind of like for our Maya users, like our channel box. It's gonna tell us where things are in space and it's gonna allow us to go in and type numbers in um, to move them to particular locations if we want to or set the origin, um, that kind of thing. Okay. So right now we don't have anything in our scene. So all those numbers are really reflecting is where my cursor is in my viewport, that's it. Um, our status bar down here on the left, I kind of skipped past it. Um, it's just going to give us information about things we have selected in our scene or just our scene in general. Okay. Okay. To the right, we've got our viewport navigation. Uh, honestly, we're going to use our hotkeys for this mostly. Occasionally you might come in here and poke at one of these buttons to do something, but generally you're gonna hotkey it because it's just a heck of a lot faster to do it. Up above this, we've got our command panel. This is where we're gonna do a lot of our editing. Um, one of the things that's super cool in 3ds Max that I actually like over Maya is that we utilize what's called a modifier stack, kind of like layers in Photoshop, where when we're adding different components to a particular piece of geometry, it stacks it. Um, so we can go into various levels of the stack and make adjustments. We, the closest thing we kind of have to that is our history in Maya, but it's not as intuitive and it's not as accessible. Um, so it's one feature of Max that I actually really, really like. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we're working with that as we move forward. Um, all right, in terms of navigating, this is going to be really straightforward for you guys because we've already done a lot of this. First things first, if we click in any one of these views, you're going to notice that it highlights in yellow. That means that we are working within that particular viewport. Okay. If I hover my mouse over any one of these viewports and I hit my space bar, so why don't you guys try that, it's going to maximize that view. Anytime I hover my mouse over any one of these viewports and hit the space bar, I'm now going into that view. Okay? All right. So if I maximize my perspective view, hotkeys for moving around, guess what they are? What? Well, that's, oh, that's moving geometry, but just for moving our camera around. Yeah. Get used to, yeah. Finger's gonna be on all again, and it's the exact same as Unity, which also happens to be the exact same as Maya. Makes it really nice, all right? Okay, now, if you were to use your 
navigation bar down here in the right hand corner. Uh, this little orbit button, if we click on it, that's going to allow us to orbit around our scene. Just like if we were holding down our alt key. Now what's kind of cool about going into this rather than just hot keying is if we click on one of these little X's on the actual orbit sphere, it's going to allow us to orbit around that particular location in space. So sometimes that can be really useful if you're trying to focus in on a particular area. It's right down here in the, I'm just showing the non-hotkey version of our, so right now we're doing alt, right, in a combination of our mouse keys. If we weren't hotkeying that, Aurora, look up here real quick. If we weren't hotkeying, getting into those view options is down here in the lower right hand corner. So I went into rotation, which is this little orbit. It's like a little, it's the third one in from the bottom. Looks like a, looks like a planet. Yeah, it looks like Saturn. Yeah, you see it. So I'm just, that's all I'm doing is it's the non hotkey version of it. Um, but the reason I'm showing it is because of this added little feature that you don't get when you're just using your hotkeys. Do you see it? Or is that where you're getting? Hey, Brendan, would you mind showing her? Okay. Okay. The next one over is this hand. This allows us to pan back and forth, up and down. Nothing really all that exciting with regard to that feature that we don't get in our hotkey. But good to know where it's at. Um, the magnifying glass zooms in and zooms out, as you would expect. Also, nothing all that exciting with, that's different from our hotkeys. Um, alt, middle mouse button. So remember, it's always a combination. When you guys are moving in and out, it's just like Unity. If you're moving in and out of your scene, it's always Alt and a combination of one of the three mouse buttons. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, in the lower, lower right, extreme lower right hand corner, this just moves us in and out of our expanded view. Nothing fancy. We're using our, our space bar hotkey for that. Um, and then we've got this little box with brackets around it that allows us to focus in on a particular object that we have selected. So for those of you who had my Maya class and for those of you who did it in Unity, which is exactly the same, what's the hotkey to focus in on a selected item? F, good, it's exactly the same here. All right? So it's just good to know in, in the event you get into a pickle for some reason, sometimes it's nice to have these or at least know what they do. All right. All right. So, um, viewport basics. We've got our grid, much like we do in Unity. Although I will say, I find the grid much more useful in our three D packages than I do in Unity. Um, it gives us a much clearer sort of start point, I think, than Unity does. Um, our origins right here in the middle. What's our origin in terms of values? Zero, zero, zero. Yeah. Um, when we start modeling our table and chairs, which we're going to do next week, um, and even some of the stuff we're going to do today, I find it really useful to begin at the origin for a variety of reasons, particularly when we're du duplicating around a specific pivot point, that kind of thing we'll talk about. But um, One thing to note, if we're looking at this, down here in the lower left-hand corner, we've got our three axes that we've been working in. Do you guys notice anything different between 3ds Max and Unity? Anybody pick up on it yet? Yeah, Z is up in max. Z is your up axis. It's important to know that for a variety of reasons, particularly when you're moving out of pieces of software. So for example, how many of you have used ZBrush? No? Have you, Brandon? Yeah, you, I know you have. Anybody else use ZBrush? Mudbox? Okay, uh, I haven't messed with Mudbox as much, so I don't know what the up axis is in Mudbox, but... Um, if you're moving geometry in and out of those two programs, you have to kind of know what the up axis is because you have to account for it in one or the other in order to orientate it properly to work with it. So just something to keep in the back of your brains for now. Nothing we're going to really worry about for the moment, but just be aware of it. Okay. 
Um, in the upper right hand corner, we've got our view cube, which is a nice little option that if we're in perspective, very similar to how our axes handle works in Unity, where we can click on the center of it and we can start to adjust our current um, camera. At any point, as soon as we go back to our hotkeys, it moves us out of it, right? So if I wanna look at a top-down view, if I wanna look at to my backside. Now, keep in mind, right now, it's still taking perspective into account. So even though I'm looking at it a side view, I'm still seeing perspective. It's not orthographic, which means the perspective is pulled out, okay? If I wanted to go into an orthographic style view, I've got options over here in my upper left-hand corner. You're gonna see where it says perspective. I can change this to orthographic and it's gonna pull perspective out of my camera and allow me to work in more of a 2D flat environment. This is much, much more useful when you're having to make intricate selections with regard to vertices or you're having to really focus in on where you're moving things with regard to the grid and that sort of thing. Okay. So I'm gonna put myself back in perspective mode but the view cube can be nice. This guy right here. Yeah, if you click on it, we've got perspective, perspective and orthographic. Um, these might be good hotkeys to kind of keep in mind as well. Eventually, you may use those depending upon how often or frequently you're moving in and out of those, out of those views. And when you're modeling, it tends to be fairly frequent. Right? Um, but the view cube, super handful, handy. Um, if you ever want to get it back to sort of its home position, you can just click on the little home icon and it'll revert you back to your start point. Okay. Okay. Um, some things of note, and we're just going to kind of gloss over them now, but eventually it's going to maybe play a little bit more importance to us as we start dealing with scene scale and how we're bringing that into a VR environment but we can make some adjustments to our grid system in terms of how much of it we're seeing and what the dimensions are and that sort of thing. Um, so to do that, if we go into our tools, I just wanna show you where it's at. Go to, go to your tools menu, click on it. Make sure everybody's there first. And what we're gonna scroll down to is where it says grids and snaps. And right at the top of that sub, second sub menu where it says grid and snap settings, I'm going to click on that and it's going to pull up this menu for me. Now, here's an easier way to get to this. See this little icon at the top where it says it's a three and it's got a little uh, magnet next to it. I see all that. That's one of our snap, snapping tools. If I right mouse click over it, it's gonna pull up that same menu for me. We're actually gonna go into that quite a bit when we're trying to go into our snap tools and dictate what snaps to what. So do you guys know what I mean when I say snapping? Kinda. So what's happening is, let's say I grab a vertice over here and I wanna make sure that it is right on top of this other point or this grid space. If I turn on snaps, as soon as I move it, it's going to go right to that spot that I'm moving it to, and it's going to snap it right into the location that I want it to, rather than kind of free-forming it. So remind me again how many of you worked in Photoshop. It's just like snapping in Photoshop. Same concept. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. And you can see that in our snap settings, we have a variety of options that we can choose from. We can snap to other vertices. We can snap to grid points. We can snap to edges. We can snap to the middle points of objects. We've got lots of options here and depending upon what we're trying to accomplish, we need to change it up accordingly. Okay, okay. so back to the grid part. Um, if we choose our, or click on our home grid tab, this is where we can go in and we can start making some adjustments. So let's say this grid is like, you know, I wanna have more going on with it. Oops. I want to dictate spacing. Um, I want to dictate how much more of it I'm seeing, right? I can expand this thing and make it bigger. My recommendation is whatever number values you choose, make sure that they're not decimal points. <laughs> <laughs> you may help me help you <laughs> make your life easier. You don't want to work in percentages. Okay, use nice whole numbers. It'll make your life easier. 
especially when we go into dealing with scale. Okay. Um, of which we can go in and dictate what the scale of our scene is doing. Back in our customize menu where we were before, we have an option for unit setup. Right now, we're just going to leave this at generic units. Um, but when we start dealing with VR and we start modeling specifically to pull into a headset, we're going to start utilizing some very specific measurements to account for how we're going to actually view see, view things in a scene based off typical body size and that sort of or viewpoint height and that kind of thing. Okay. What's that? Where was it? Yeah. So it, go to the customize menu. And then it's the about three quarters of the way down under unit setup. Yeah. Part of the reason I bring this up too is this is something that if you're working in a pipeline and you're working with several different people on the same project, it's really important to establish what your unit scale is at the beginning of the project. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise you're gonna have hiccups when you're passing files back and forth. Um, and they're not fun hiccup. I mean, you can work around them, but it's just kind of a pain in the butt, All right? So. So establishing that early and often is a good thing, and it is something that eventually we're going to have to really take into consideration when we're working in, in a VR space. Um, am I... Oh, I was like, Sorry. what? <laughs> okay. Um, ask your question while I troubleshoot. So do I remember correctly that Unity does uh, one unit per meter, one meter per unit? Yes. So yeah, if we're really planning on working predominantly back and forth, we probably want to have it set to metric here. Metric meters, yeah, we will, we will change it to that. For now, it doesn't really matter. What we're, we're not, yeah, but yes, but yes, absolutely. Um, Who broke it? <laughs> Something like that last thing that you know, It just. I wonder if I hit something. Like, no, my feet are around any. Where's Jay? He's there. Hiding. Hiding. Well, like, you know what? Why don't, why don't we take it? It's a good time for a break. Yeah, it's not bad. All right, not bad timing. Maybe it, maybe it was the universe speaking to us that we need to take a break. What are we at? Half the class. Sorry, like, not that's that's the <laughs> all right, two o'clock. Yeah, all right. Let's take a quick break while I figure this. Oh, what the hell? I don't know. That's my. Book. What's that? Oh, thank you. I'm wondering how.